Hello. <laughs> You're all scaring me. I didn't expect this many people here. I thought I'd only get like five people down the front and we could have a little chat. So this is kind of going to be a little chat, just about my kind of little experiment into the flipped classroom, um, kind of reasons why I've done it, what I think I should get out of it, what I think I probably should have learned before I did it, and things like that. Um, I've been on a little adventure with National 5 Computing Science. Um, it's a great opportunity. I like National 5, right? I like it because it's flexible. I like it because there's lots of opportunity to do things that are really engaging for learners, things that modernize the computing science curriculum, get kids making and building. And, and I think that's really important. And, and what I wanted to do was make my classroom more a place where that happens. Make the classroom somewhere where there is lots of practical activity. Because I don't know about you, but my classroom um, often, particularly when teaching things like hire, not so much sometimes with the people, but certain things like hire, was just like lecture theatre sometimes. Like bang, 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 knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Um, so I wanted to change that. And one of the reasons I really wanted to change that because um, because I did, a, I did a bit of reading. I love this, this particular book. I mean, let's go into this. So, um, how do we make kids better at what they do? How do we know how much they're learning? What do we know that, how do we know they're learning? And how do we help them to improve? And the main reason, the biggest impact that we can have as teachers is to give really good feedback to our learners. Spend, and that takes time. So I'm thinking, right, I, think I need to improve my feedback. I need time to do that. But also, I need to understand my learners more. And this is a great quote, because it, it talks about this idea. This comes from John Hattie's Visible Learning. If you want to buy, if you want to do your CPD, <coughs> right, and you want, you want to get some books to do some reading, these are fantastic. Because they show, um, they really just show what impacts on learning. And the good thing is that most of the things we do have a positive impact on learning. But feedback is one of those big hitters. If you think about Dylan William and all this stuff, you know, Scotland invested hugely in assessments for learning. Talk about you know, uh, identifying learning intentions and doing all that, and we all talk about that now. Uh, and that's all about, that includes all this stuff about feedback. So feedback is really, really, really important. So my little adventure was really just to take my traditional classroom, where the kids come into class, and then we do maybe five minutes chatting about the homework, which they sometimes did and didn't do. Um, often they didn't do it because they didn't get it. And just at the time when they were trying to apply the knowledge they'd learned in class or hadn't learned in class, just at that time when they're trying to apply it and they're sitting doing their, trying to do their homework, applying, trying to apply what they were told in class, just at that moment, that key moment when they needed help, there's no one there to give it to them. So I have my classroom and I'm getting kids coming in and I struggle with this and maybe spending some time with the brain to see them at lunchtime. You know, all the time you're kind of pushing on with your curriculum, you've got things to deliver, you've got to carry on with that sequence because time's important. And a lot of my kids would spend you know, a fair amount of time, okay, they're doing software development, they do bits of programming and things, but they spend quite a lot of time listening to me. And that's uh, I'm sure, I'm sure it was always a wonderful experience, <laughs> but that to me feels like an inefficient use of time. Um, and I kept thinking, well, there's got to be a better way to do it. And then I, I started picking up this kind of flipped learning idea, kind of come, comes from the state, coming from the states, and this idea that you take that lecture content and you can condense that down. And you can change your classroom so that that homework activity is watching a five or ten minute video. And learning from that five or ten minute video until you've got it. So um, you can replay. So watching that video, maybe engaged, in, and then from because you're doing that work at home, you're watching the video, then in class we have. I'm not lecturing now, I'm not doing that big lecture, so I'm not spending half my lesson doing that. I've got more time for different strategies to approach learning. learning. So things like more paired work, 
more group work, setting longer projects, actually getting the kids to build real things, not just this little task that ticks the box in the assessment criteria that says they've got to have a loop. Yeah, but what for? I'm actually trying to get the kids to build real things and do real computing. And taking that pressure off having to me having to give them that one hit exposure to the knowledge is what I'm trying really trying to do. Um, I mean the reason why I mean why am I trying to do it really? Um, our kids are different. We probably started, many of us probably started our teaching career, you know, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe 2 or something like that for me. And kids have changed, and they do change, have changed over time fundamentally. Kids sit there, they're, they're watching YouTube. They are, uh, they're using, they're exposed to multiple things at the same time. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, television on, doing this, doing that, distraction, distraction. And we are not kind of circumventing that system. We're not getting ourselves in there somewhere. We get the kid to come into school, switch off the mobile phone, switch off all the distractions, switch off all that, and sit down and be still and listen to us. And I kind of think we can kind of subvert that learner's experience, that kid's experience, and actually by having video resources and things that they can access when they want, how they want, we can kind of subvert that and get in there. So I think that's, that's kind of important. So I think this idea of a flip model helps us do that. Um, I don't know about your school, but my school has lots of extracurricular activities, kids away on trips, doing a sporting event, or going to a music school, or offer a music lesson. Lots of things going on in our schools, in my particular school. And this, act, this way of organising, this having this flipped classroom idea, where we've got the, the lecture content and a short, short video, and what I've also done is I've planned the learning sequence out, so that learners can actually get ahead if they're busy. So if someone, if a particular learner knows that they've got a music recital or an orchestra trip coming up, they can get ahead, they can preload so that when they come back from that trip, they haven't missed anything. All the stuff is there. And there are some challenges about doing that, which I'll come to later. So it helps busy kids because they can get ahead. Um, and it also really helps kids that don't get it. Haven't you always been, I'm sure everyone in this room has been at some lecture or talk and think, okay, slow down, I'm not, can't, I don't, I'm not following it. You want, um, sometimes you just want to stop and pause the teacher so you can get your thoughts together. And other times you want to just replay them because you just didn't get it. And so this gives, gives me that opportunity. And it also means that in class time, I can have real, real differentiation because I can focus on learners that need support, meanwhile letting learners that are, that are flying ahead go ahead. Um, and I, because I'm a quasi-rewind teacher. And I actually get to know the kids better. Um, one of the things that I've, I've found is that I actually, because I'm spending much more time with kids, doing practical work, following through a sequence of work, um, I'm actually finding out their strengths and their weaknesses much more. So there's much more interaction between me and the learners than there would have been if I'd just been doing this kind of lecture-led class delivery. But also, because I'm using small groups, or I'm using teams of learners, because they're, I've got different strategies for doing different things, sometimes there's a wee team people put together to build something, or sometimes there's also a paired work or group work going on, there's much more interaction between learners. And that's a really positive thing. And as I said, I've said already, I'm really differentiating. And I'll come, I'm going to talk about this a little bit further in, but the structure of this actually means that I can start to tease out this idea of mastery learning, where you, where you kind of don't move on to the next topic until you're ready. You actually have to master the one that you're studying currently. Um, but there's loads more reasons why flipped learning is important and why it's a great, great potential model. Um, just to give you, it's nice to give you some statistics. The research on flipped flip model learning is emerging. There's some good research, there's some variable research. Like all research, it's kind of, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt sometimes. Um, this is Clinton Vale High School in America. They decided to go like whole scale, whole scale, 
into flipped learning. Um, they were, this is a school where they have 75% free school meals, given just outside Chicago. And this is basically their statistics uh, before they did flipped learning. So these are the kids that are failing English and mathematics. And the number of discipline cases that they have. Kids aren't engaged with the curriculum, they're not interested. They're going off because they're bored, because they're sat in rooms, not engaged in active learning. They're just sat there. When they flipped their classroom, these are the results that they saw. Now I would take a piece of that action. I think it's pretty good. And I think that there's real potential in this flip model to improve outcomes for our learners. And that's really what we're all about, isn't it? We want to get our kids passing our computing science courses, passing and doing better than that, just doing, getting really up there. And then we give people like Wendy real problems because the thresholds move right to the top and everyone's starts worrying about that. But no, that's okay, that's good, excellent. Um, so let me tell you a little bit what, I was actually, what I've actually done. Um, this is not about learning and teaching, okay? This is a tick list for examination and assessment. It is not about learning and teaching. So if you pick that up and start to think, right, I'm going to plan my course today, that's the wrong approach. Um, it's, it's, that's the end point. What, what I did, and what I think everyone really needs to do, is take that and turn it into very clear learning intentions. How do we structure the delivery of each of these parts? What is it we want our learners to do? I, I love I can statements, you know. I think primary school, I learned heaps of stuff when I used to visit primary schools and consolidated projects. I used to go in there and see how learners planned learning and how teachers work with them to plan it. Brilliant. So if you get a chance to visit a primary school to see some of the work that they do, I really encourage you to do it. Because they have profiling and setting your own goals and targets pretty much nailed. They do really well. Um, so what I did was I went through uh, the Information Systems Unit for 9 to 5 and I basically turned it into a set of um, learning intentions. Because that's what I wanted to start with for actually planning the learning experience for young people. Um, and then from those learning intentions, and don't underestimate the amount of work involved in doing that, it took me about a week. Um, you know, week solid. So it took me a long time to do it because I'm actually thinking of what goes into each act, trying to think of what goes into each activity or what could go into each activity. Um, so for my learning intentions, because I wanted to do a flipped classroom, because I want something that's going to be accessible, um, I want to think about what I'm saying. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I used to lecture in higher, or to talk about intermediate two, I used to do that lecture-led thing. I'd have my notes, I'd know what I had to do, but I wouldn't really plan it down to the individual words and so on. So something that I could have said in maybe five minutes, I said in 15. You ever had that feeling? Um, I want to have flipped learning, so I want things to be very concise, to be succinct, to be on message. So I took my learning intentions and I actually made them into a script. I wrote a script for what I was going to say in my video. Now this is how I did it. Um, there's lots of ways to do this, so this is how I did it. And I did that because I really wanted to keep on message. I want to be absolutely focused about um, what I'm delivering. Um, and try and pull in kind of interesting contexts for learning. And I'll, and I'll show you the wee snippets of some of the videos that I've done. And a rule of thumb, if you want to go, go ahead and try this, one page of A4, 12 point, is about three minutes. Because um, you don't want to rush it. You want to just take your time, nice delivery, and so on. And I planned all my things to be maximums of 10 minutes. Building the video, well, I just kind of did this thing where I recorded my voice. I hate listening to myself. <laughs> I think it's, so does everyone in my family now, because they've heard take two, take three, you know. Um, well, that's another thing, use humour. That's good in your video, if you can use humour occasionally. Um, so, take your time, this is what I would advise. Um, take your time, take a deep breath when you're going to record, you're going to make a flip video, and take your time with the delivery. They will be able to rewind you. They will be able to pause you. 
it's your, this, is, this is great stuff for the kids because they, they can stop their teacher. Excellent. Um, and go for clarity. You know, if, you, if you've written something and you've planned it and you say it and you listen to it back and think, that's, I'm, wa I'm waffling there, don't put it in. Go and do it again. Try and get the clarity. And, and yeah, edit. I have cut and pastes throughout stuff and drop it in bits and things when I need to, felt I needed to do something again. Uh, and you can, uh, the audio that you make, for me what I've done is I started with the audio because I wanted to make videos that then linked into that. You can do this in a variety of ways, but this is the technique I use because the audio then directed my video. The, the activity that happened on the video came from the audio because I thought about the scripts. You can see the progression that I've gone through to get this done. And um, software to do this bit, the recording part, well, a lot of folks use Audacity, which is fab, and you can do this all with Audacity, and it's free, which is good news. <coughs> um, so you can use Audacity. I have used Audacity heaps of times before, and it works brilliantly for this kind of role. Um, be because I've got it, and I'm, I'm just doing it that way, I actually used, for myself, I used Adobe Audition. Um, but that's just because I've got that software. It's not cheap software, so, um, but Audacity does exactly the same thing for free. So building, building my videos, I've got the audio, and then what I went on to do, uh, I, did, I, did anim I chose to do animation. Uh, and I'll go through in the, the next slide kind of other ways that we can do this. But uh, I, did, I started off doing stop motion animations, at 12 frames per second, 720 HD. Um, and I built this on my desk, it looks like a robot. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I don't know, Day of the Triffids go, I don't know what it is. I, this isn't my animation rig, right? Um, so this is what I built, and all it is, it's my, my little video camera, sellotaped to the bottom of the tripod. <laughs> and some, some of my kids' reading lights that they have inside of their beds. So, you know, while I was doing this, poor children could have to read the big light on. <laughs> Every, you know, everyone, everyone makes a sacrifice in the love household for this, you know? Uh, so, and I sat there doing, doing these videos, stop motion animation, um, you know, all the bits for the video cut out, and printed out, and then cut out, and, and so on. Took a bit of time. Uh, my, my eldest daughter is a big fan of uh, that what's the movie now, it's, um, uh, I can't remember the title, it's gone now. Steven Spielberg movie, all the kids to portray, all that stuff. What's it called? Super 8. Super 8. My, my eldest daughter is a huge fan of Super 8. And while I was doing this, she would wander past me and just say, Production values! <laughs> and I, I was like, okay. So, I've got to, so I'm thinking production values because I want it to be a reasonably high quality. Um, so I did, you know, I tried to do it. I tried to do production values. So I'll let you see. This is a, this is a kind of. I put together bits out of a couple of videos. Um, what I did was I did some videos to start with, the stop frame animation. Um, my video camera wasn't brilliant. So I then changed to doing digital only, digital only animation. And I'll play about a couple of minutes of this and then I'll talk about some of the other bits and pieces from there. Oh, hold on. Let me get some audio. That would be good, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Think about that part. Okay, we can hear this. Excellent. Database is part of everywhere. You never see them. They're hidden behind the tools and services that you use every day. Ever wondered where Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter put the data? Yeah, it's all stored in the database. Where do Google store the details and pages that you index from the internet? In a database. Where are the contacts in your mobile phone store? In a database. Databases do most of the work in the information systems that we use every day. So what is a database? Is it just a random collection of stuff all squeezed in together? No. Databases are organized. Databases have a structure. And all the data we store in them fits into this structure. Very simple databases are called flat file databases. They store data in columns of fields and rows of records. Let's think about a simple database that Bob uses to store his address book. This database contains the names, addresses, birthdays, and telephone numbers of his friends and family. 
So that was the kind of, that's the stop motion ones, and then I went into doing it as a digital stop motion kind of idea. We use databases to store much of the data in our world. Flat file databases are simple databases that store information about uncomplicated things. The contacts in your phone, the birthdays of your friends, the list of computer games that you own. This is Bob, and he runs a sweet shop. His customers can choose confectionery from a large menu that is displayed in his shop. On his menu are five different categories of sweets, and there are several sweets in each category. <coughs> so you can kind of get the idea. Um, my thing was that uh, I wanted to try and get a, a good quality product, something that I, that I would then be able to do my teaching with until the next time they change the course, kind of around. Hopefully. And a resource that would kind of stand at the test of time with that. Um, there are lots of ways to make a video. That's kind of, I think, looking back at that, I kind of maybe just went a little too far, but that's okay. Um, you can make the video in a variety of ways. The idea is obviously keep it short. Um, but there's lots of software to do it. You could just do your, you know, if you've got slides and presentations in it, you could just talk to your presentation. I've seen stacks of great flip learning, uh, YouTube videos and so on, all just done in that way. Someone's talking to the presentation, maybe they've got a little webcam on them, it's in the corner, of the, so it's a, bit, it's a bit more animated. So that's a great way to do it. And this, these bits of software are all out there. This camp, so you could use Camtasia and Kino, you could put it together with uh, PowerPoint and Cam Studio. Cam Studio is brilliant and it's free. So you can use that to do your flip learning, which is fab. Um, you could do stuff with uh, smart notebook. You could use smart boards, a big smart notebook board. You could do that and record it with something like uh, Screenomatic. And I think smart has actually got a screen recorder in their software, if I remember right. I think so. So you could use that as well. Um, uh, if you've got an iPad, of course, you can use this fab thing called uh, Screen Chomp that Mr. Mr. Brian Clark over there told me all about. Um, Screen Chomp is a fantastic app. You can, you can put your screens together and you can then talk to it and record your flip lesson with your screens and then export all the video just from an iPad. So it's a great, great, great resource. Um, if you're making your videos, you might want to pair up with someone to do it. Um, these two guys, they kind of wrote, they wrote this book called Flip Learning, um, about flip learning, where they can do lots of things, talk about their classroom and their journey and how they did it. Um, and they recorded their lessons together. They would share that effort. They would actually, maybe even actually do the teaching, the team teaching lecture. So there's a bit of interaction and delivery. So you could buddy up with other teachers and do it that way. That's a nice, that'd be a nice way to do it. And whatever you do, if you're making your own videos, add callouts and captions and zoom in and pan and get detail into it. Try and make it interesting. You know, if you're making your video and you're bored, then think about it, right? Um, you want to keep it light, you want to keep it interesting, you want to keep it really engaging. And you want to stay on message. So remember you're landing attention, that's really important. Okay, time wise I'm doing okay. Yeah. The video is the easy bit, because what are you now going to do? Um, how do you know that little Johnny or little Sally has actually watched the 10 minute video? How do you know that? Well, you always start your class with a little kind of warm up session. How do you go with the video? Yeah, great. Hey, tell me about it. Tell me something you learned from the video. Tell me one thing. I learned that uh, you have many sweets for each category. Many sweets for each category, that's really interesting. Do you remember what you called that? that there's a relationship there, isn't there? What would you call that? I would call it one to many. Ah, so you've done your homework. <laughs> you, you need some mechanism. Now, ideally, I, mean, I haven't got this, this far advanced, but you do need, you need some mechanism for, for doing that kind of interaction. Now, a little icebreaker at the start of the lesson, that'll work some of the time, um, but I think you really need some kind of formative assessment built in here. Um, because you want to also identify who needs assistance, who, is, who even though they've watched all that, isn't getting it. So I like this idea of having that formative assessment built in, whether it's a little online survey, a little Moodle thing you set up with some simple questions, just to test understanding. 
something I need to put into my stuff, something that lets me do that kind of formative assessment so I can get feedback about who needs to do what, where we need to go next. And then of course I've got this huge problem and I used to talk for 25 minutes of my 50 minute lesson and now, <laughs> now I have to fill that time. But that's a wonderful thing to have, time to do things. So I, I have used most of these things uh, with my N5 class lesson, little guinea pigs. Um, great things like obviously sort of grouping group activities, we do like group poster design and things like that. And, uh, think, pair, share. You. you have two minutes, right? To tell me something at the end of that two minutes, and we'll share that, and you'll get together, then pair up, and talk about things. Um, I have lots of peer support going on. I try to buddy up learners as and when required, and that's kind of difficult because sometimes you're pulling someone off. If someone's got a bit ahead. You might pull them off the thing that they're doing to go and help someone. So you've got to be kind of prepared to rejig and move around your class a lot. Um, I love paired programming, where the kids have actually got to talk about what they're writing when they're making something and building it. They've actually got to discuss, I think we should use a force, I don't think we should use a force, but I think we should use, you know, have that discussion, debate going on, really exciting. Jigsaw puzzles, right? Jigsaw puzzles are brilliant, particularly for doing things like, like maybe like web page design, where you give different page elements to different learners, or software development, um, where you give individual modules of code to separate people. And they then have to develop them standalone and then integrate it all together. So you just give them the bit that they've got and then they've got to work together to solve the whole thing to get it all to link up. So that's kind of cool, I like that. Um, a team-based learning, um, what I really would like to do once we get a little further um, is uh, I would really want to have kind of long extended projects. Build a, prop, build a real app and so on, that kind of idea. So there's lots of things going on in my class, lots of class activities. I mean, this is just kind of screenshotted with my horrible underlines, screenshotted. I have a, a document where it just spells out some of the progression the kids are doing. And they just dump in, sort of drop in and out of that. So they might have things like build this, um, other activities like discuss, and I kind of signpost all the stuff as I go. Uh, and then code, go and code something, go and build something up. Um, uh, using wireframing, so I've got a whole of wireframe diagrams in Google Draw, the kids can just log in and use that stuff. Uh, it, it's kind of all up there, so lots of things. And I like Code Academy, right? You, got, you, need, you need an HTML5 browser. But I like Code Academy. But I don't like just Code Academy. If you as a teacher think you can just go, hey kids, Code Academy, I'm going to the academy, I'm have a cup of tea. That's bad. Because Code Academy is brilliant at introducing programming constructs. It's brilliant at setting small challenges, small problems, at scaffolding the learner through that progression. It is absolutely rubbish at pulling that all together. You, as a teacher, need to do that. So you can use Code Academy to teach things like Python and JavaScript. Great. And, but you need to, at certain points, Take the kids off that IDE, off the Code Academy website, and say, now build me this from what you've learned there. And you need to set tasks where the learner starts with a blank canvas and builds on what they learned in Code Academy. Because Code Academy itself doesn't, it, it scaffolds everything, it doesn't excite the learner about that building up their own solution. So I think that's really important. Um, where do you put your stuff? Anyways, I'll just crack on. Right, I, I stuck mine on YouTube, and the reason I stuck mine on YouTube is because I have a script, I can get closed captions, I can make it accessible. Um, I also stuck all the stuff in a shared drive in Google Docs, um, which I'll show you the link and you're welcome to help yourselves to that it's there. Um, I like YouTube because you get all this stuff about, I don't have to worry about transcoding for different media, like, what? You know, whether it's for mobile, list, YouTube does all that stuff, so I don't have to worry about any of the heavy lifting. And I can make a play, playlist with all the course videos, my videos, other people's videos, build a course playlist in YouTube, which is wow. Um, I, use, I use the cloud to share my content, 
because I don't have any paper in my classroom. Nothing's on paper. Everything's in the cloud, everything's in Google Docs, and the kids just go in and they copy a document when they need it, they work on it, and they put it in their repository. And then they can share it with me, and I can go and see digitally what they've done, I can annotate it, I can copy it, I can share it, show it to others, I can do a whole lot of things with that, and they can share it with their friends as well. Um, so I've encouraged them to kind of embrace that, to collaborate, and I'm using Google Docs, and Google's, Google Drive and so on, to label all that stuff. Uh, I'm going to crack on. 305, is it finished? 310. 310, oh, extra so five minutes. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about um, this kind of diagram. I kind of really want to get to a point where I'm doing mastery learning um, because I'm a firm believer in that whatever I do as a teacher should be improving outcomes for learners. It should be making allowing them to be better. My job as a teacher is not just to deliver a course, it's to help my learners get better, improve, and develop over time. And I think this idea of mastery learning, of saying, you haven't mastered that yet. You don't understand loop structures. You're not ready to move on to something more complex. So let's think of some things that we can do, that you can do, we can do together, to help you get better at that particular, uh, that particular area. So I like this idea of not moving on until you're ready. So that what happens in the classroom becomes a little bit like chaos, but managed chaos as a teacher. Whereas I've got some kids here still making a database, I've got others here making a website, I've got others over here who are starting to do some JavaScript. I've got lots of different things because they're following this kind of course profile that I've put together. But I'm taking off something and doing another task, I'm doing another activity. So I'm, you're getting in about the kids, but you're, um, but you're also making sure with this mastery idea that they are not moving on to something until they're absolutely ready. Because that will actually improve their ability to answer questions in the exam and to perform in the coursework and so on. If you're doing that kind of mastery thing, you've got to stop controlling the class. You've got to juggle, you know, teachers always juggle lots of balls. This is like taking a like, hundred balls and juggling it, so it's quite complicated to try and do. But it works if the kids are in charge of their learning, if they want to do it. One of the things in a flip model, um, I'll come on to it in a second, um, is that if I'm doing the mastery learning thing, I've really got to personalize every activity. So I'll have a kind of bank of things, and then occasionally I'll just have to think of, at the top of my head, Right, you've made, that, you've made that web page, but actually what you need to do now is you haven't hyperlinked these areas, so you need to think of that. Why don't you go away and study again how to do the hyperlinks, make me just a page of hyperlinks to set resources on your social networks or something like that. So you come up with tasks really quickly to try and um, cover the areas that you need. Um, and I do lots of remediation and support in, in, in that kind of mastery, mastery kind of situation. And really, I think what it does is that the kids understand now they can't hide anymore. You probably, you know, if you're lecturing your class, you have three kids in the back of that class that are like, that, not interested in what they're doing, hiding in the class because they're not engaged. They're just happy to sit and listen to your lecture for, and then maybe, maybe get a C if they're lucky. They'll just sit there and they won't really engage in what you're doing. If you've got this approach, and everyone's doing different things, they can't hide anymore. And that's a challenge. Um, it's interesting what mastery, le level, mastery learning can do. That's the sort of thing you see in a class, right? That's your kind of graph. That's performance in the classroom. The typical lecture in the classroom, that's what you see. If you can do the mastery thing properly, and that's kind of where I really hope to try and go, you end up with that. You, you kind of close the gap and you should raise the ceiling. You move the kids up. And that's, that's really, really useful for our learners. Challenges, and I'll just come up with a very quickly go through those. Um, you have to be prepared. Uh, you've got to do the, the work up front. So, you know, there isn't that fly, but flying by your seat in your pants doesn't work anymore with this. You really have to be prepared. It takes that effort to be prepared. There are challenges, thank you, Brittany. Uh, <laughs> you know, the kid that sits there, I don't want to do this, just talk to me. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me, what, no, I want you to understand this. I don't want you just regurgitate it like a set of facts, that's wrong. Um, 
I haven't come across this yet, but I'm sure it's going to happen. Concerned parent says, you're encouraging my child to watch videos all the time and use the computer and do stuff at home. Where's the homework? Where's the real work? Well, that's being done in school. Um, because it's being done in school following the real work that they're doing to understand the content at home. And the so I'm worried that, you know, that, that could be an issue. Um, yes. If you're juggling all these balls, you need to know what you're doing. And that's important. So your professional development is really important. And that's where things like Plan C and the lead teacher stuff is going to really help us. Because we all know that there are gaps in some of our knowledge for these new courses. And I think you know, those developments help us. So we need to just we need to make sure that we're prepared, just like Yoda. Um, and I think one of my challenges, one of the things I need to do multiple lots of you go from mastery level learning, lots of it, then I need to test when they're, when they're masters. So I might need lots of bits of assessment to do that. So building lots of bits of assessment. And when do I give the N5 units? When, when do I do a mock exam? All of that I still need to kind of work out and think about. So um, all of my flip learning stuff is at that URL. Um, some of it's not finished. There's lots still to do. If anyone kind of wants to help out, um, it's in all. Everything's in Google Docs. If you want to help out, if you want to make a little part of it, make one lesson, or you want to just dip in and help out, crowdsource to, to get to the finish of this. Please get in touch. I really would welcome that. A couple of people have said that they will help out, so that's great. Uh, that's a cracking book. Uh, read that. There's also a kind of follow-up thing. It's also useful to read. Um, yeah, and I'm done. On time. Amazing. So, thank you very much. Uh, I'll very happily take any questions. Wendy. Do you ever get the learners in your classroom to create videos? Is that what you've been experimenting with them working in the years? Have you tried that and then the video then becomes available for everyone else? I haven't yet, but that is a really good idea. And I know some people have done that. Saves yeah. a bit of time. Yeah, that's a cracking idea. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really good, good idea. Hi. Yeah, I, I like the stuff you did. But, uh, I, I can see how this, all this could work like a good, good overview. But that's N5, that N5 work, but the actual practical work, particularly the project here, that stuff's hard. Yeah. Can you actually get to that point? With this, I mean, I can see how you can give a good overview, you can get close, you can get the updates, those stuff. But to solve some of those, the first thing, the first thing is the video is not the be end all and end all of this. What is important really here is that the video allows you to engage in active learning in the classroom, where you can then get to the level that you're talking about. So when you you want to develop learners so that they're able to successfully complete the assessments and engage with computing science, and we encourage them to want to do more with computing science generally. To get to that point, we need, you know, flip learning is not about the video, so that's the bit that everyone thinks about. Flip learning is really about what you do in the classroom that builds on what was in the video. It's the, it's the active learning, it's the working with young people, it's the different the variety of strategies that you use. Using the right sets of strategies should get you to the point that you want to, where they've got a deeper understanding, they're able to explain what they do, not just regurgitate a set of facts, they're able to actually explain it and understand it. So that's how I think you get there. It's what you do in the classroom that gets you there. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. I'd agree. I, I, I'm using the classroom, and I think you actually can get further than, than what you would have originally done. So you get closer to that, but I don't know what it's talking about. I'm not going to Any other? Yeah, Steve. Really? Really? Um, I just I just went free characters, or copyright free characters. I can I just googled that and I got a whole of stuff up and I I just used what was there. Yeah, so I just I went and grabbed that stuff. And I know most of the assets and stuff. I think a lot of them are in that Google Drive. So just go in and help yourselves. Okay, I'm aware it's kind of time and so on, so again, thank you very much.